The sea is a perfect cloak for the stealth of the enemy. Within its dark depths, throughout its vast expanse, the enemy can hide. And even as he hides, can approach our shores. In two world wars, submarines took thousands of lives and so harassed our shipping that they very nearly choked off the flow of materiel needed for victory. After World War II, rapid progress in developing new types of submarines made it clear that the enemy would soon be able to threaten us with complete destruction. A submarine using nuclear fuel would be able to cruise almost indefinitely beneath the surface. And it could be foreseen that, thus cloaked by the sea, the submarine would be a mobile launching pad for missiles with atomic warheads. At relatively short range, it could direct a total carnage on our cities and production centers. This specter of annihilation, fast becoming starkly real, was perhaps the most ominous of all the threats to the nation's safety. The nation's leaders responsible for that safety acted. In the year 1950, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a group of leading American scientists from naval, industrial, and university establishments were brought together and handed a vital part of the problem. This was to investigate the most effective means of detecting enemy submarines. Reviewing all the pertinent facts, these men found promise in several areas. One was the wartime discovery used to enable airmen downed in the ocean to signal their plight, that low frequency sounds travel through water for long distances. When a ditched airman detonated an explosive signal in the water, the resulting underwater explosion created sound waves. Sound waves travel through water about five times faster than through the air, and much farther. Like all sound waves, as they spread out from their source, they weaken. But it was discovered that low frequency waves could still be detected hundreds of miles away by underwater listening devices called hydrophones. A second lead was the discovery that submarines radiated strong, low-frequency sounds. This, coupled with the knowledge that such sounds traveled long distances, was highly significant. For the Hartwell Group, it provided the basis for an optimistic report. A system for detecting submarine low-frequency sounds at long range, they concluded, might well be feasible. The Bell Telephone Laboratories was authorized to undertake development of such a system. These laboratories had already carried out important underwater sound research. Also highly pertinent was the fact that they had invented the sound spectrograph, a research device which sorted the various frequencies of sound and displayed them visually. This research tool was now successfully modified to analyze and display low-frequency underwater sounds. To pick up these sounds, unique underwater equipment had to be devised. It included highly sensitive hydrophones, which could be put down a mile or more deep in the ocean and left there to operate trouble-free indefinitely. Sea cables of great complexity and extraordinary strength were required. To design such a cable, experimental models were subjected to the most exacting physical and electrical tests. Electronic devices to determine the direction of the sound signals were developed. All the work was correlated with an intensive study of the behavior of sound in ocean water. The Navy, the laboratories, and Western Electric worked closely throughout the project. So well did the experimental work progress that within a year, a prototype submarine detection system had been designed and built off the Bahama Islands. The prototype station was located on the island of Eleuthera. 
the tests carried out at this experimental station showed that the proposed method was practical. Here is how it works. An array of hydrophones carefully positioned on the ocean floor receives underwater sounds. The hydrophones convert the sound impulses to electrical signals and transmit them through a cable to the shore station where they are analyzed. The signal is complex, containing many frequencies. As the signal passes through the analyzer, the frequencies are sorted out and displayed on a continuously moving strip of electrosensitive paper. We can see how the display is created by observing a display console in operation. The signal causes the moving stylus to burn a trace. This technique is called LOFAR, short for Low Frequency Analyzing and Recording. To the initiated, these dark lines are significant. After a year of testing at the Eleuthera Experimental Station, the basic design for a land-based, long-range, underwater listening system had been achieved. Could the principles proved at Eleuthera be used to create an effective oceanic system for detecting underwater threats? To find out, the Navy authorized Western Electric to engineer, manufacture, and install a nine-station system designed by Bell Laboratories. When this system proved workable, additional stations were installed on the East Coast and on the West Coast. The building of each station began at the edge of the sea. Reconnaissance teams surveyed possible shore station sites along remote and desolate stretches of shore. Frogmen explored the beach approaches to establish the best cable route. Engineers made careful electrical measurements along the proposed cable run to be sure ground currents would not create serious interference. With the shore site chosen, the dark ocean depths had to be compelled to yield their secrets. A hydrographic survey ship began the search for the best place at sea to put down the hydrophone array. Since this would be a pinpointing operation, bases for precision navigational aid such as LORAC had to be set up ashore, often in wild coastal country which could be reached only by helicopter. This equipment made it possible for the hydrographic ship to know its precise position at all times. Somewhere out there, a hundred miles or so from shore, a place had to be found where the hydrophone array could be put down. Somewhere out beyond the continental shelf, on the slopes where the Earth's crust makes a spectacular descent to the ocean abyss. Below 6,000 feet, the waters are as black as only a sunless world can be. Somewhere in that jagged descending terrain, a flat area for the 1,800 foot long array had to be found. Other questions would have to be answered. Will the bottom support the array? Are there acoustic obstructions? Are there deep ocean currents which might dislodge the array? To answer these and many other questions called for a series of checks and tests using oceanographic instruments. A whole complex of hydrographic and oceanographic data were compiled. On the basis of these data, several possible sites for the array were selected. Now the question was, which had the better sound reception? In Winston-Salem, North Carolina, Project Caesar personnel analyzed all the survey findings and prepared a report to the Navy. 
This report recommended exactly where to place the hydrophone array and the precise cable route to the shore. This route had to be known exactly because differing depths and bottom conditions would require different types of cable armor. The specifications for each cable went to the Simplex wire and cable plant in New Hampshire. This is the largest plant of its kind in the world. It was specially equipped by the Navy to produce cable for the Project Caesar installations. The conductors for the cable must conform to the most precise electrical tolerances ever required in a cable design and must give trouble-free electrical performance through the years. The cable must be able to withstand the ocean's buffeting and must be impervious to corrosion, marine boring organisms, and all other physical and electrical hazards the ocean may hold. This is the largest, most complex ocean cable ever made. Yet it meets unprecedented requirements for quality and reliability. After the pairs of heavy conductors have been twisted, they are armored according to the ocean bottom conditions along the cable route. The completed cable is transferred from the plant to the cable ship. The machinery on this ship for both loading and laying had to be especially designed for Project Caesar. With several cable types of different weight and size being taken aboard, the loading plan had to be carefully worked out to assure the stability and trim of the ship throughout the long sea voyage to the laying area and during the lay itself. The bulky, heavy, stiff cable presented considerable handling problems. In some cases, the relatively short, shallow water section of cable was transferred into a landing craft. With its cable aboard, the craft was transported to the offshore location where the section was to be laid. Before beaching operations started, Navy frogmen reconnoitered the landing route through the shallow water zone. In most cases, a trench had to be blasted to protect the cable from surf and tidal action. Beach the cable, flotation bags were used. The cable was then hauled in by tractor. Frogmen put steel casings around any cable lengths which might still be damaged by surf. the cable laying ship with the array and the main section of cable aboard headed out to sea. Approaching the sea site, precision navigational aid equipment was used, enabling the ship to reoccupy the precise position indicated by the survey, within plus or minus 50 feet. As the navigational aid fixes were being plotted, the captain followed the ship's track intently. The moment of decision approached. Out there, far below the surface of the sea, down in the deep blackness, among the steep and rugged contours of the descending ocean bottom, was an isolated area of flatness. Within that small flat area, the 1,800-foot array had to be put down on a specified bearing. The ship maneuvered toward one particular pinpoint on the face of the globe, designated Point Love. Here was the job to be done. The array anchor had to be made to bite into the ocean bottom at Point Love and hold under tension as the tug pulled the ship. Array and cable had to be paid out on an exact bearing from the anchor point until the array rested on its prescribed location. 